project. Um, this is work I did as a master's student, and um, I'm going to talk about, give you an idea about the study area, the history of the monitoring efforts, and then um, how I became involved. Talk about the monthly sampling that I did um, with the community, and then talk about two main parts of my thesis, which was stream sampling I did this past summer, and then um, creating a website for the group I worked with. And then just tell you how kind of things are currently going and with any questions. So to begin, um, the main study area for this project was the Catawba Watery River Basin, which I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it. It's not quite as big as basin as the Chesapeake Bay, but it does cover about 20 counties in both North and South Carolina. And um, in 2008, it was named America's Most Endangered River by the American Rivers Group, um, mostly due to outdated water management strategies, um, particularly in the growing metropolis of Charlotte, which is right uh, north of the South Carolina state line. Um, so in this basin, there are 11 dams and reservoirs, which are owned and managed by Duke um, Energy for hydroelectric power generation. And um, hundreds of thousands of people also depend on the river for drinking water. But um, one of those reservoirs, Lake Watery in South Carolina, is a specific area of interest for this project. Um, it's the eighth largest lake in South Carolina. Um, it's often cited as being our most constructive reservoir. And as of 2000, about early 2000s, um, about half of the shoreline had been, had been developed. Now, of those 11 dams in the whole basin, um, Lake Watery is the only one in South Carolina, and it's the only one downstream of Charlotte. It's the last one in the chain. So for a long time, the people that live there have been very proactive about their water quality and concerns about what's going on upstream from them. And in the early 90s, the first water watch group was formed on the lake with members from the two main homeowners groups, um, one in Fairfield County and one in Kershaw County on both sides of the lake. And so they got together, um, they used funds resulting from an industrial pollution incident upstream of the river to create this water watch group. They bought themselves a probe, um, kind of developed a sampling uh, uh, scheme, I guess, and collected data from 1999 to 2003. Um, unfortunately, they, you know, they had this great plan, but they didn't really do anything with the data they collected, so interest kind of petered out as people became more involved in the relicensing of the dam on the lake and just other projects, because they weren't really seeing any tangible results. So given that designation in 2008 of the most endangered river and the growth of Charlotte, um, the homeowners decided they wanted to get things going again, so they came to USC uh, looking for technical assistance and support, some help getting their monitoring restarted. So we partnered with them. Um, to do all this, we helped them create an advisory committee so we'd have a main point of contact between all the handlers and the two different groups. And what we did was help them revamp their sampling protocol. So, uh, whereas before, you know, they would, when they would collect data, it wasn't always on the same day of the month. They'd go sometimes a couple times a month, some months they wouldn't go at all. Um, so what we did was help them really establish what they're going to do every month. And every month they go out on the same day, we start around the same time, we sample all the sites in the same order. Um, we take out two boats. One is owned by the Water Watch Group, and the other is a volunteer boat. Um, we take out two probes, one of which is owned by them, and one which USC supplies, and USC is uh, responsible for calibrating and keep getting the probes ready. And usually, myself and another uh, professor from USC would go out, so we'd have two people. One could go in each boat and help them if they had any problems with running the equipment. Um, we added a 20th sampling site down at the bottom of the dam before they were only sampling the previous 19. And there are three different sites. The yellow ones are in the headwaters, and we sample at one foot. The purple ones are in the embayments, and we sample at one, four, seven, and ten feet. And then the main channel sites, we sample at all those depths as well as 20 and 30 feet. Um, we sample for dissolved oxygen, temperature, turbidity, specific conductivity, and pH. And Following every run, we generate just a simple one-page report from them. Um, when I started this project again in about the summer of 2008, we thought using those profiles we could do some really cool 3D kind of stuff for them. And it turns out that's not really what they wanted. They just wanted a simple thing that everybody could understand. They could send it to all of the homeowners, and nobody, you know, they'd know what was going on. So um, we did that again for about six months. And at the end of those six months, we had to renew our contract with them. And as a part of our original agreement. We created a, a comprehensive document looking at that six months' worth of data, the data they had collected previously, um, kind of analyzing it, looking for trends, and also comparing it to historical data that uh, South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control had. So out of that document came basically, you know, the consensus was that their water quality was pretty good. There weren't any major issues, um, but there were some trends and kind of questions that remained that, you know, 
know, we suggested they look into. And one of those I decided to do, um, look into as part of my master's, and that was why Big Watery Creek was consistently more turbid than all the other sites. And this is the Big Watery Creek in Bama right here. This is where the river comes in. So that, for whatever reason, that those two sites were always way more turbid than anywhere else. So I decided to go out and do some stream sampling to see if we could figure out, you know, where this was coming from, what was going on. And I started by going on Google Maps and looking where, um, trying to find locations where roadways appeared to cross the streams. And I should note that Big Watery Creek is this top one, and the embayment is also fed by Little Watery Creek. So I was looking for sites on both streams, as well as all the tributary streams to them. So that's a lot of sampling sites. And when I started this, I guess I didn't really think about how many that actually was and, you know, whether or not they were all going to be sampleable. So the first time I went out, I quickly realized that I wasn't going to be able to find them all much less get to them all in one day, maybe even two days, because a lot of the roads are very rural, you know, unpaved, it's really easy to get lost if you don't take a GPS, which I didn't do the first time. Um, some of them are only really flowing when there's been a lot of rain. This big picture is off of Interstate 77, which, you know, you don't really want to go stand on the side of the interstate. Even if I had, you couldn't reach it. Um, it's too high, you know, there's fences down there. So I quickly realized, I think that day I only got to like six sites, it was ridiculous. Um, so I realized I was going to have to scale way back, and I ended up um, going out a couple more times to try and find good sites, and I ended up with these six sites, and they're all on the main Big and Little Watery Creek. So these six sites I went to nine times um, over the last summer, between April and September. Um, I tried to go out following rain events. There weren't really any rain gauges or any good way to find out about specifically that area. So what I would do is, living in Columbia, um, the weather, you know, storms would come through in the afternoon, especially during the summer, and it tended to go past the lake. So I would watch the weather online and make sure that it actually was raining out there. So when it rained in Columbia, I'd go, and then the next morning I'd go out. Um, I'd always try to leave about the same time so that I got some consistency there. Visited the same the sites in the same order, and I took out the YSI, and I would record the surface turbidity. Um, so here's a quick look at the data. I will say this, this picture you see where the, the probe is in plenty of, plenty of water, that didn't last the whole summer. A lot of the streams, especially on Little Watery Creek, which is here, you can see sites one and three, I couldn't sample most of the times I went out because there just wasn't enough water in the creek. So, um, for the, just to be quick, you know, Little Watery Creek, don't really have much to say about, but Big Watery Creek was where I really found something interesting, I think. Um, every time I went out, the differences in turbidities between Site 2 and 3, Site 3 was always much higher, or higher, maybe not always much higher, but later on, I mean, you can see, you know, huge differences. And I will note that I know that you can't actually have a negative turbidity, it only goes to zero, but um, I wanted to keep that as it was because that's what the probe said, and uh, I can tell you that its waters were very, very clear, so that's not a mistake. Super clear water, and then the next site would be much more turbid. And this marked line is the um, cri the DHEC criteria for turbidity in lakes, which is 25. Just showing you, you know, at site 3, which is just prior to entering the lake, the turbidity is usually much higher than that. So, you know, I kind of was like, well, what's going on between sites 2 and 3 making them this way? And in talking with the community, we've had a, I had a number of forums where I'd go out and tell them what I was doing for my research about this and about the website I'm going to tell you about in a second. They gave me a lot of advice. Um, one thing they told me about was a, an ATV park that had recently been built in the area and they were worried about it um, causing sedimentation and also from noise and things. So, you know, I was like, well, I wonder where it is. And when I looked it up, it turns out it's between sites two and three. Um, I probably, this is kind of hard to see, but I promise that all these squiggly lines in here are the trails at the ATV park. So what this shows is that, you know, these trails are going across the creek. And actually what I did is it was really interesting to find out that it crosses some little watery creek streams too. I would have never known that because it wasn't on their map. Um, so coming out of this, you know, what I told the Hemmers is, well, you know, it looks like that there's something going on between these two points, and I would bet that it has to do with this ATV park. And actually, I found this picture um, from, this is from the Carolina, it's called Carolina Adventure World. This is a, a picture somebody put up on a website. Um, you know, they have their posted that you're not supposed to ride in the streams. They've got a bridge over one, but people still do, um, as you can see. And this is obviously after a big rain, and that's really muddy, and that's not what you want to see. So I'll tell you in a second what's going on with that now, but I think that um, Carolina Adventure World is definitely playing a role in that turbidity issue. So... That was the stream.
screen sampling, the website, um, when I started this, I really wanted to create a website for them as a way that they could get the word out about all the great work they were doing, get you know, people involved. And my original inspiration came from this website, which is a site from New Zealand um, incorporating Google Maps. And what they've done is each of these little colored dots are beaches or places to swim. And you can go and click on them, and this box pops up, and it'll give you a grade and say, you know, yes, it's safe to swim here based on bacterial levels. And so kind of what I thought was something similar for Watery, where they could click on each of the sites and look at the data that we just collected. And, um, that was my original intent, and people seemed into that. They liked the Google Maps idea. But after talking with them, I kind of realized that cost was going to be prohibitive. You know, we are working with volunteers here. We don't have a huge budget. And in order to do something like what I just showed you, you really need your own domain so that you can control everything. Um, what I decided to go with was a freely available Google site, so I could keep the Google functionality. Um, there are a lot of pros to it. You know, it's free. It's relatively easy to set up. Um, I made it in such a way that it's really simple for them to edit and maintain each month to keep it relevant. They only need to change about, I think, two things, maybe three. And, um, I've left them detailed instructions on how to do that. And if they want to, you know, um, flesh it out in the future or get their own domain name, they can do it and keep it. Um, unfortunately, again, you can't really incorporate more of that advanced kind of programming in GIS. And then while I was working on it, I found out, you know, it's still a work in progress. Things are always kind of changing with it. They're making sometimes improvements. Um, sometimes you'd be working on something, you'd get so frustrated, and then like two days later, it'd be a super easy way to do it, which is frustrating for me. I mean, nice, but frustrating. Um, so just real quick, this is what it looks like. Um, that's the website if anybody wants to check it out. But this, you know, this front page, it has a, a photo slideshow of photos that people sent me from, you know, activities on the lake. It's got a countdown to the next sampling run. And then it's got a page where people can go and say, hey, what is this water watch group? What do they do? What's important? How can they help? Um, I made a little slideshow for people to go and, you know, learn what is water quality? Why do I care about dissolved oxygen? Why is that important to me? Um, there's a monthly sampling page. This is my version of that Google Maps. Um, when you click on each of these dots, a box does pop up, and it shows you the GPS location. So if people are out on their boats and they want to go check things out, they can. Um, tells you what kind of site it is, what depth we measure at, and the name of it. And um, I think I don't know if I have. There's the monthly reports page, where people let me go back, where people can um, go and download each of those monthly reports that we generate for them. They're all in PDF form. Um, there's a links page, a calendar, so you can see the events going on, um, the sampling date and other meetings they have, and then a contact us where they can email them and get some more information. So currently, um, I was actually just back last weekend to go to their second annual water forum now. It's a community-wide event they hold. And, um, based on the attendance, I'd say they're still going pretty strong. It was a really nice Saturday, really actually warm down there. So the fact that they had so many people show up and be there, not out on their boat, was nice. Um, a lot of people, there were a lot of really good questions being asked by people, and so they've got a lot of support. Um, as far as I know, they're working on trying to partner with Carolina Adventure World to correct some of those turbidity issues. Maybe a little, you know, my suggestion was that maybe another grad student could come in and um, have a project looking at the efficiency of different techniques for controlling that erosion. And I don't know if that will happen, but I do know that Carolina Adventure World has been very open and receptive to um, being a good neighbor and trying to do the right thing in, in terms of water quality. So that's good news, I think. I know that there are grant applications out to look at phosphorus loading and exchange in the lake. Um, one of the Dan Pepper from USC is really interested in that. So they're trying to get some more money to support further research on the lake aside from just the monthly monitoring. Um, like I said, the website is now being used to disseminate those reports. Before, uh, Dick, the chairman, used to just send out this mass email to everybody, and so now he sends out the link, and they update the calendar. I went and looked at it. They've been changing some stuff. It's good. I'm glad to see they're using it. And um, they actually had an increase in funding for this year. Um, this picture is from last year, I guess 2009, so Water Forum, where Duke Energy actually gave them some money to support what they were doing. And while that wasn't renewed this year, both the homeowners groups um, decided to up their contributions so they have a bigger budget, which is nice for them to do some more stuff. So with that, hopefully we can get to 15 minutes. Um, I just want to acknowledge everybody at USC and all the people I worked with, all the homeowners. They are really great. I think it's really awesome that they're so involved and doing really good work, I think. And um, thank you, everybody.